Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, is it really the end for Arsene Wenger? VAR, it's been approved for the World Cup, but is it ready for the Premier League? And what's happened to the best of British managers? Pardew, Big Sam and Moyes, they're all under it after losing big games yesterday. Three, the best of British journalists with us this morning. Oliver Holt, he's the chief sports writer at The Man on Sunday. Jack Pitbrook is a football journalist with The Independent. And Matt Law is the football news correspondent with The Daily Telegraph. Morning to you guys. Good to see you as ever. Thanks for coming on. Don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. OK, let's have a look at some of the headlines you're waking up to on Sunday morning. Bad news for Arsene Wenger this man on Sunday. It's Rob Draper's story. A new low for Arsene Wenger. Joachim Love, the Germany national team manager, World Cup winning manager, being lined up to replace, to succeed Arsene Wenger as the Arsenal manager. You always know it's bad news when the names are swirling about and another one swirling around is Carlo Ancelotti, former Chelsea manager, and it's a straight fight between Chelsea and Arsenal, according to the Sunday Express this morning. For the Italian, he's on his way back to the Premier League, according to the Express. The Sunday Telegraph this morning, VAR gets the green light for the World Cup, despite the backlash. Matt was at Wembley. Um, to watch the latest shambles with it on Wednesday night during Tottenham's 6-1 victory over Rochdale. We'll get into that in part two of today's programme at the Sunday Times. They concentrate on some of the football. Another big win for Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool. They beat Newcastle United yesterday at Anfield. We'll talk about them a little bit later on in the programme as well. Some transfer stories as well. Sunday people. Big story this from Steve Bates. He says that Andres Iniesta, Barcelona midfielder, one of the greats of the game on his way into English football, leaving Barcelona for Manchester City. He'll be here at the start of next season. We'll get on to that in part five of today's programme. Uh, De Gea, he's staying. De Gea is a stayer. £350,000 a week, that's what they're all getting these days in the Premier League. He's staying at Manchester United. Big money on offer as well for Man City's players if they win the Premier League, which they surely will, and the Champions League. It's a million pounds a man, according to Mike McGraw on the back of the sun this morning. Um, but this is where we're going to start. Where else would we start this morning? Daniel Taylor's column, the least Wenger deserves, is a royal send-off. And Ollie's column this morning, the shame of how some treated Wenger will cast a long shadow over his reign. Arsenal will have to get it right with the appointment of a new boss if Wenger is to leave. But you do think, finally, Ollie, that the time is right, don't you? Why, why have you changed? What, um, what's persuaded you that uh, time is up for Arsene Wenger? Yeah, reluctantly, Neil. Mm. I, d I, do think, yeah. Um, I do think time is up. Um, I don't know. I think over the last, last four or five years when there's been a lot of unrest um, at Arsenal, I've kind of felt that while Wenger's been getting Arsenal into the, into the top four, then I think he's been doing a good job. He's been providing some excellent football, um, as he always has. And unlike many Arsenal fans, I totally understand every fan thinks that their club should be winning the league. But I think that in, some, in many ways, Wenger has overachieved. Um, he's been up against the money of Sheikh Mansour. He's been up against the money of Abramovich. And I think that realistically in some ways the best that they could hope for was was third or fourth and they finished second a couple of seasons ago they won the FA Cup two years on the spin so I think some of the resentment against Wenger has been misplaced um, but they finished outside the Champions League last season and they're going to finish outside the Champions League this season and they're 13 points at the moment behind Spurs um, I think they're 30 points behind the leaders, mm. Man City. And I just think, in common with, I think, most people now, sadly, Arsenal look like a team who are going backwards. They're not going forwards. They've, um, other teams are going forwards. Liverpool are going forwards. Um, Spurs are going forwards. Even Man United are, are recovering some of the ground that they lost. And Arsenal aren't. And I think that... You know, the, the two games against Manchester City, again, just showed how far, I think, Arsenal have slipped from the team that they once were. And probably also, you know, then Arsenal are not the first team to be embarrassed by Manchester mm -hmm. City this season. But I think it also showed how, how far off Wenger has become in terms of cutting-edge coaching. How, how difficult was it for you to make the decision, Oli, to write this piece? Because, as you said, the, over the years, you've been very, very loyal to Arsene Wenger, to his principles, to the way that he wants to play football. You've been very vocal about that, but how difficult was it to make the decision to say, OK, this is, you accept that this is it for him? 
I think I think actually a lot of journalists have been have been fair to Wenger, and um, because I think most journalists, I think actually most people in football accept that he's been a, he has been a great thing for English football. He, in many ways, he revolutionised the way English football is when he when he arrived uh, in this country, and you know he's always conducted himself with great um, elegance and grace. Um, and his teams have been fantastic to watch, but I think you can't really you can't really say that anymore. I, I, as I try and explain in the piece, I just think actually the, there's something about this week that seemed to strike a lot of people. I think. I mean, obviously I watched Jamie Carragher talking about this and and Thierry Henry on on Thursday night and um, after their second defeat to Manchester City, and it, everybody seemed you know for, it, for a lot of people it felt like a line in the sand. I think part of it is because. I think part of the reason that felt like a line in the sand this week was because Manchester City were what were what Arsenal used to be. Mm -hmm. It was so obvious that, that you know that, the, that Arsenal Arsenal just looked like the past, and City City are what City are what Arsenal used to be. And I think it just showed how far off the pace Arsenal have gone. Mm -hmm. Everything just seems tired and stale. They seem like one of those kind of um, governments that's just exhausted. And I think Wenger, Wenger's reign at Arsenal is. Exhausted, and I think again, as many people have said this week, it feels that he's at the point where somebody needs to tell him, somebody at Arsenal just needs to say, mm. Enough, you know, it's over, and it's almost going to be a kindness, I think. Now, Jack, how, how, do, how do Arsenal approach the, the exit? What is the exit strategy for Arsene Wenger if, well, there, if there is to be one? Well, I, I, unfortunately for them, I don't think they can rely on Wenger making the, the right decision himself which means that they're going to need either Gazidis or Kroenke basically to tell him clearly that his time's up and they're going to have to find someone they're going to have to then find someone for next season. It's difficult because normally when you sack a manager at the end of a season you would do it you would try and sneak it out after the last game if you can. Obviously Wenger slightly or very different circumstances. I don't really think they can do that in the same way. So they are going they would have to announce it before the end of the season as much as Wenger would be pained by that and therefore try and give him the send off that he deserves. Mm. Well, I don't why? know if anybody has anybody at the strength. Anybody at Arsenal got the strength to do that? I suppose that's the that's the, well, the question. The only person who could do it was Cronky as well. I mean, it would just come down to Cronky, and he he wanted to give him the contract last summer, so it would seem strange. I mean, it's difficult to do the long goodbye starting from now while the Europa League is still live for them. I mean, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that if they won the Europa League, he would stay. Um, and that's a very big target for the Europa League, so they can't really start it now. I mean, whether they can do it with four games to go or three games to go once everything's over and, and give him a, a, a bit of a goodbye, I don't know. But It's difficult, because the last thing Wenger would want is the, the sort of sympathy farewell. Right? Yeah, and he the last would hate thing it. I think he would indulged. hate it. Yeah, I think he would hate it to start with. I think he'd grow to like it eventually, but while the, while the season was going on, I think he'd find it very awkward. Mm. When, when the names are in the wind, the various names that are being banded around um, as his replacement. Um, do we do we take from it, given our given our previous experience with other clubs? Do we take it that those are the names in the frame? Oh yeah, they're definitely putting feelers out. They definitely think. I mean, part of the reason of giving him the, the two-year contract was they they didn't know what they were going to do last summer, and I think in giving him the two-year contract was almost the start of their process. Then of we're going to try and buy ourselves a little time, so when the time does come, we do know what we want to do. So the feelers are going out. The difficulty they've got is, you, you know, you see people talk about some of the names that they would like, and, you know, you, you talk about the Allegri's and the, the Simeone's. People like that, I don't see why they'd go to Arsenal at the moment. You know, they're, they're the sixth best club in England, and they'd nowhere near spend the most amount of money, so it's a really difficult job. So I don't see any of that real top band of manager that three or two, three or four years ago they might have been able to get it. I mean, I still think they could have got Guardiola if they'd have gone at the right time. They're not going to get that, so they've got to think more, they've got to be clever about the process now. They're going to have to pick something out a little bit rather than just going for the guy who on paper looks the best guy. Mm. So it's, it's going to be difficult. I think one of the, again, one of the things about Wenger and, and the fans, that, I think that the, maybe the fans, I've, I've said in the past, the fans have had you know, exalted expectations of what of where the club should be, but I do think that the I do think that the fans have a right to expect at least that they should be in the 
that Arsenal should be in the top four, and, and they're not even close to the top four now. And I think one of the things that will, will happen when Wenger goes, whenever that is, is that the heat will then suddenly be turned on, on the owner a bit more, I think, and on the club hierarchy, which it hasn't really been until now. Wenger's been the, the weather vane for all of that. And I think there will be more uh, focus then on exactly what the club are spending and, and how little they are spending compared to some of the other um, leading contenders. And I think that will, that will get interesting because I think Gordon Strachan um, was on Sky earlier this week saying he thinks it will probably be 10 years until Arsenal are you know, challenging again properly for the title. Um, because when a manager like Wenger leaves, as we've seen with Ferguson at United, it throws a club into it throws a club into mm -hmm. chaos. Sure. Even if some people think, think the club I, is in the chaos. Fans, now. The fans got so annoyed, though. I, I think just going back to why the fans did get so annoyed, even when they were getting Champions League football, was they were missold a dream with that stadium a little bit. I mean, they were constantly told, once we get in the stadium and pay the stadium off, you know, sky's the limit, chaps. You know, look yeah. at Bayern Munich. We're going to be like Bayern Munich. Look at this. We're going to be doing everything. Aren't we clever? We're the guys who have predicted financial fair play. That's all going to come home to roost for us. None of it's happened. They've been mm. sold a couple of dreams whereby they were kind of told, just wait a year or so and it's all going to come, come back. And it's just got worse and worse. And it's a good point on Kroenke because he's been one of the worst owners for me. Terrible. Mm -hmm. They've never had to appoint, Kroenke hasn't had to appoint a football manager, an Arsenal manager. Ivan Gazidis hasn't had to do that. Um, so they're, they're, they're novices in that respect. How do they go about finding the right man, the new man, to take over? I think, the f I think they need someone who will bring Arsenal closer to the standard of modern, modern uh, aggressive Premier League teams that are set by Tottenham, Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester City, which is what they're so obviously far away from at the moment. Um, there's, I think there's quite a few different people who can do that. Leonardo Jardim, Brendan Rodgers, Sarri at Napoli. They've got some good options. And I think it. I know it's not as attractive. I know Matt said it wasn't that attractive. I still Napoli think Napoli had to go and lose last night, didn't they? Yeah. Going to Roma. I, I still think it would be a really attractive job to, you know, to maybe not people at the very top level, but managers slightly I, beneath that yeah, level. Yeah, I mean, it's. A, yeah, I agree with that. I just think that, but you know, two or three years ago, they could have been trying to get Guardiola's and Klopp's yeah. and people, and they've and missed a series of boats. Yeah, they're shopping below that level now. Um, I mean, I, I think someone like, he's, he's not a household name as such, but Paolo Fonseca, they're going to have to look at people like that. Shakhtar Donetsk, who's done a very good job there in the Champions League. They're going to have to be more clever about it. They're yeah. going to have to look at people on the rise, basically, yeah, exactly. on there, rather than... You, you like Rodgers, though, don't you? I do like Rodgers. I mean, I've, I've always been a fan of Rodgers, and I think, he, I think he got not a raw deal at Liverpool, but I think he's not, he's not remembered with great fondness at Liverpool, I don't think. Um, but I thought he did an absolutely terrific job there. You know, I think we forget how, quite how close he got Liverpool to winning the title. And people say, well, it was all because of Luis Suarez. And obviously Luis Suarez is an absolutely fantastic player. But um, I thought he did a terrific job there. Um, it's hard to gauge in some ways the job he's doing at Celtic because Celtic have, have, all, have been so dominant for so long in Scotland. But, but he's probably doing all he can do. He's Celtic. doing all he can do, yeah. absolutely. So. Um, oh. I Are think it, I think it'd Europe, be a good option. Whenever they play anyone half decent in Europe, I mean they're one 0 up from the first leg against Zenit and go and lose three 0 conceding the first goal in eight minutes. I just think every time in Europe you look to him to not not like that we know they're not going to go far in Europe, but to just get a result to show that they fall down every time. It'd be a worry for me that would. The other worry for me on Rogers would be that he would have zero time with the fans. I mean, yeah. they, they need to... Why, why? They need to turn around the mood there completely. And with Rodgers, there would be so many people who were against that appointment because of Liverpool and what happened at Liverpool. Liverpool were 10th when he left. That if he lost three out of the first five games or something like that, the atmosphere could be just as bad as it is now with people saying we've got the wrong guy and going mad about it. I just... It's, that would be a big risk for me, Rodgers. Mm. There's a lot of discontent. I mean, it, all of us who've been to Arsenal know, you know, sitting around that press box. I mean, discontent at Arsenal is, has been very, very close to the surface. Mm -hmm.
for a long time, and I think Matt's right about that. I mean, that's, whoever is the new man, whenever that happens, they're going to have to get off to a good start because otherwise it's going to be toxic. Very that's, that's, that's why, that's that's why they're probably... Just, just to... Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Just That's probably why they're also looking at people like Arteta and, and Thierry Henry. Yeah. People say they've got no experience, but those are the guys who might get a bit more time because of the link with the club yeah. and I, who I, might I, just galvanise it a little bit. I think that's why they don't need to be worried about the comparison with Sir Alex Ferguson leaving United in 2013. Obviously when Ferguson left there was a huge vacuum, but at Arsenal the vacuum's happening now. Like They're already in the dip and have been for five years. Mm. And that means that almost anyone competent who comes in after Wenger would naturally give them that new manager bounce that they need. Do you, do you feel at all uncomfortable discussing Wenger's replacement before the great man has even left Arsenal. I, I've, I must admit, I've got s s a slight discomfort over it. Um, no. Or is that just the, it's the I way think the, as long as the world, world we live he's, in? He's, That's what happens. He's got himself to this point as well. I so mean, you've got no sympathy for him? No. He's on... I mean, it's not all down to money, but he keeps signing contract after contract. I thought it was laughable this week when he said, you know, I've turned down the world so I shouldn't have to answer these questions. I don't have sympathy for him. I've, I've got respect for him, but that's different to having mm. sympathy for him. He's been, he's had the run of that place, and he, he deserved it for many years, and he hasn't deserved it for many years. And so, no, I don't have any sympathy for him. No, I mean, I think if, for as long as these conversations are happening inside football, we're allowed to have them in the media. Like, there's nothing wrong with discussing the, you know, the, who's going to replace Wenger, given yeah. that these discussions are happening inside Arsenal. Yeah, OK. It um, happens with every other club, Neil. Yeah, sure. Not, no, no, OK, it's, yeah. just, it's when yeah. someone's in a job and we're already discussing yeah. who's going to get it. I just wonder what your thoughts were. So, just quickly, um, end of the season, yes or no, is he, is he gone? Will he go? I think, I think he should be gone. I think Arsenal are a great club and um, they should be better than 13 points behind mm. Tottenham Hotspur. Sure. Jack? Yeah, he's got to go. And any other organisation of that size, underperformance like that, would be would would lead to would lead to getting replaced. Don't need to you ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm coming to you, Matt, next actually, because I'm going to talk to you about VAR because you're at Wembley on Wednesday night, weren't you, for Tottenham against Rochdale? More on that coming next. Okay, let's talk uh, VAR now. It's on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph this morning, getting the green light. Um, for the World Cup, despite the backlash. Matt, you were at Wembley on Wednesday night for the latest um, fiasco. Mm. Can you just talk us through your experience of, um, of the decision-making process from, from your vantage point, which, of course, was in the press box yeah. for that FA Cup tie? It, I mean, it was, it was truly bizarre. We, I mean, people we say, will say we never have any idea of what's going on, but we really did have no idea of what was going on. I mean, the... the the, the biggest, even with monitors, there are even with monitors, monitors of because the, 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 the monitors box. in our press box weren't um, at the time showing the VAR process at all. It's not like we were sat there and all of a sudden it was flicking to what VAR was showing and the, assist, the, the video assistant referee was looking at. So we we were as clueless as everybody else in the stadium. I mean, you you really felt for the fans because you were sitting there for a good two minutes. I think you know we, we, we timed one of them well over ninety seconds. Just absolutely no idea what was going on, um, and they've got to find a way of making it inclusive for the people in the stadium. Because at the moment, VAR is for the people at home. It's for the non-paying, non-going fans who watch at home, which is fine. But you've got to look after the people in the stadium and make it an event for the people in the stadium. And it was so bad because the fans inside the stadium lost confidence of what was going on to the extent that as the game went on in the second half and the goals were going in, after each goal there was a pause before celebrations mm. because you could see, I mean the referee had a terrible time because he, he fell into the trap of sending everything to VAR and because you could see, started to be able to see him checking everything, there was an audible pause before every celebration and it was just bizarre and that's what Pochettino was saying afterwards that you just can't have a system whereby fans don't feel they can even celebrate a goal when the goal goes in. But I, d I don't think all of this is not is is true, but it is also not a reason not to proceed with VAR. I think. I mean, I don't think you know there's a real there's a reason it's on trial, and that's to iron out things like this. And I don't think there's anything wrong with VAR. There's just something wrong with the people who are operating it at the moment. Um, and 
you know, I think it, it's absolutely still the way forward. I think what Matt says is absolutely right. The, the, the ab no brainer is that, that, is that um, the fans have to be involved, the fans in the stadium have to be involved in the same way. I mean, football is this, is this you know, the richest game probably in, in the world, and yet we are so clueless in terms of technology um, that it's embarrassing. If you look at what all the other sports do, tennis, rugby union in particular, cricket, you know, you get to see the the the, the, the whole decision, the equivalent of VAR is part of the is part of is part of the stadium experience. And so why for them not to have considered that. I mean it look it should be fairly easily fixed, but football is so suspicious and so patronizing to its fans, it's it's pathetic. But I wonder if the difference is that in cricket and tennis the decisions are all measurable. So it makes sense to use technology to decide them, whereas in football, so many of these decisions, particularly like is it a dive or is it a foul, they're subjective. And that means that you can't, you can't, measure, the, you can't measure them and therefore it doesn't make sense to watch them a hundred times because you won't find out the right the answer. The referee at well, Wembley yeah, as well. You'll, you'll, find, you'll find out, I mean, in, in the language of VR, you'll find out the right answer sometimes. You'll find it out more often than... You'll get more correct decisions than if just allowing the referee to do it in in real time, as they say, because clearly sometimes a referee will miss something and, and a, somebody, a, a, a official who's got time and different angles to see it remotely will be able to say, you know, on you go, that's, that was wrong or that was right. I think at the moment what's happening is we've gone from, we've gone from one extreme to the other where we were giving the officials no help on no decisions and now as I wasn't there, but as was obviously the case at Tottenham yeah. Rochdale, it was kind of gone to the other... Well, the so referee, the the referee at Tottenham, it, I mean, you kind of felt sorry for him in a way. He seemed to lose all his confidence yeah. in refereeing yeah. the game himself. It was as though, because there was this technology available to him, that he didn't feel he could make decisions without it in case he was proved wrong by it and everyone just said, you've got to go to it. So the, he just lost all confidence. Everything was going through VAR, and you, he didn't. For me, he didn't actually referee the game. He was just on the pitch, yeah. and the guy who was there to send it up to a guy looking at the screen, and he refed the game. The referee on the pitch didn't end up refereeing the game. Would, would it help Jack to have some more consistency in terms of the appointment of the officials? Because at the moment, everybody gets to have a go at VAR, don't they? It was Paul Tierney's turn on Wednesday night for the Tottenham Rochdale game. Martin Atkinson. They've all they've all had a go at it. I, which, is, which, which doesn't help when you're trialling a system. Why don't they just appoint a, a select referee, his two officials, and say, OK, you are the guys who are going to see this through and iron out some of the chinks and some of the flaws in the system, rather than this hodgepodge of, oh, you can do that game and you can be thrown to... You, know, the, you have the embarrassing situation, as, as um, Matt says, of, his, of, of Tierney's authority being eroded and shredded during the game. I actually disagree. I don't think that I don't think it really matters who's in charge, just in, in the sense that I don't think it's a it's a human problem. I think it's a system problem. Like the problem is that we've is the VAR has been introduced with far too broad a remit, and that that's where that's created all these problems. It's not because the people sat in the booth are making the wrong de are making the wrong decision at any given moment. I think it, it really comes down to a bigger question for football, which is how much do we want to change the game in pursuit of 100% decision accuracy? Like IFAB said that we've gone from 93 to 99% decision accuracy thanks to VAR, but as I was saying to Ollie, I don't, I don't think that 100% decision accuracy exists, and I don't think that it's desirable. Like I think there's too many, I mean football is, football is a game of opinions. We disagree about decisions all the time, no matter how many times we watch replays of them. Like when people say game of opinions, what they mean is like the subjectivity is the whole point. The disagreements are the whole point of the game. They are in a way. I understand that. But equally, I, I was, it was on Twitter. I, I saw a discussion on Twitter this week which resonated with me a bit because I always felt it was a terrible injustice. It was back to my youth. But I saw Dave Prentice from the Liverpool Echo having a discussion with somebody about um, a decision from the, I think it was the 1977 FA Cup semi where. Everton, it was Everton-Liverpool, and Everton were denied a, a winner by Clive Thomas in the, in the last minute. It was, it was given for handball against Brian Hamilton, I think. And it was so, you know, it was not handball. And um, that, you know, those kind, of in, those kind of injustices, people say, and I, I get the point that it's all part of the game, and maybe it's part of the game that we're still discussing that now, and it was, you know, part of Everton's history. 
But Everton, you know, Everton were denied a place in the in the final that year when the FA Cup final was a huge. Being in the FA Cup final was a huge thing, and I, you know, maybe it makes me an automaton or something. But I'd like to see those things. I'd like to see those obvious injustices ruled out. But, and maybe we. Yeah. I, I totally accept your point about one. I think you're absolutely right about the 100% accuracy. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's not desirable. But I'd like to see us getting closer okay. to ruling out those injustices. But to take another moment from football history and to go back to what Matt said earlier. Sergio Aguero scoring against QPR in the last minute in 2012. If after he'd scored, the referee had then said, I've got to check whether Nigel de Jong had fouled Jamie Mackey in the build up, then that moment, which is a huge part of Premier League history, wouldn't have been the same because everyone yeah. in the stadium and watching at home down. and in the pub would have been waiting 90 seconds for the approval of the goal. You either, you either end up celebrating a goal and then having to, to stop like when it's a disallowed goal, or as what happened at, at Wembley, you, you find yourself pausing and and not being able to, and then it's a very odd, watered-down celebration. Or we, or we do, or, yeah, possibly, or we just get used to VAR and we just get used to the, the celebrations happening and most of the time they're not going to be stopped. I mean, it happens in tennis too. I mean, sometimes you have a, you'll have a match point and, it, and it, goes to a, it goes to a line call, you know, it goes to the, the replay. It happens, it happens in those sports, it happens in rugby. I think the main thing is that the crowd... Are, it has to be part of the crowd. It has to yeah. be part of the crowd. It's a joke that it's not yeah, part of the crowd. For people, for people at Wembley to be paying for those tickets... Absolutely. ..and to yeah. not be part of all the fundamental decisions is actually a bit of a disgrace. Mm. Yeah. What, um, the, is the Premier League ready for the technology? Not yet. They've, they've got a... It's, I, I'm not all for ditching the technology, don't get me wrong. But they've, they've got to... You want to see it incorporated, don't you? I want to see it incorporated, but it's got to be slowly, and I think this experimental period is the right way to do it. I actually like your idea of doing it with one or two groups of referees who hopefully get really good at using it and then can maybe train the other referees. I think that's a good idea. But to just then throw it into the Premier League next thing, I just think it'll be cast. We'll be talking about it every single week if they throw it into the Premier League next season, and it will, it will ruin the season. Yeah, but... You'll say we'll be talking about it every single week, but uh, and you may be right, but it just replaces the fact that we're talking about referees' mistakes yeah, every single week. But we're talking about people and performances at the moment, not machines. You know, the machines. <laughs> do we want the machines to take over? You know, the, I well, don't want not, to be talking not, about. We're not talking about no. the machines, though. As we've just said, we're, talk, we're, we're talking about the we're talking about the people who are implementing mm. the decisions, and we're talking about why it's not in the stadium. We're talking about the system. I mean, I say. If, if, if you, I agree we're going to be, we will be talking about it, but it's just replacing the fact that we'd be talking about referees we'll talk, ever. I think we'll talk about, but we won't, it won't be replaced referees because we'll be talking about VAR and referees and everything else. It'll just be an added layer because part of the problem with the, the VAR on Wednesday was the referee and the fact the referee lost confidence and went to it for everything and he was at fault too. So it was just an added layer. But I think referees will gain more confidence. I mean, I think, you know, I say there's a reason that it's called a trial, isn't it? It's mm. People have got to get used to it. So it you would up. have it in the Premier League next season every single week? I would, yeah. Really? Yeah. So I, I find it interesting as well that a lot of the um, ex... Well, actually, current players were on Twitter on Wednesday night saying, no, we don't like this. Mm. You'd have thought the players yeah. wouldn't care so much about the game stopping as long as everything was right because it had such a huge impact for the players. And actually, the players were all saying, I remember a year like ago this. on television, Paul Lynch said that he was against VAR because football's all about wrong decisions. And it was one of those moments where a player says something on telly and gets absolutely hammered on Twitter. But I, um, I think he's been proven right, basically. I think he's been... I think that attitude from players that, in fact, what you really want, and this is true of players and fans, what you really want is, is flow, basically yeah. flow and entertainment. But it's, it's, those things are more important. It's interesting people, players and managers. Are incre people are incredibly resistant to change. We all are up to a point. And I just, you know, how long did it take us to bring in goal line technology? People said that had ruined the game. Mm. Right, but you goal know, line technology is measurable. I know it's, it's measurable, but that's but, why it's good. But how much opposition was there to it, Jack? There was an awful lot of opposition to it. We didn't bring it in until, I don't know, after but, Frank Lampard's goal was yeah. ruled out and, uh, you know, at the but World I'm Cup. I'm not opposed to VR. What I'm opposed to is just bringing it... It's clearly not working properly yeah. at the moment. Absolutely. You, you accept that. Yeah. And yet you'd have it in the Premier League next season when it's I not would, working properly. It's not working properly now, but that... It's, it's not going to be working properly by the end of the season. Well, though, I mean, it? I think I think that they need to... 
they need to make changes to it. They need to make big changes. They need to, need to make changes in the philosophy, and they need yeah. to make changes, as as we've all said, so specifically again, in the implementation. Try so it again in something again. for another season. Mm -hmm. with We're the... going to try another World Cup, Jack. Um, how will that go? Uh, I don't imagine it go well. I mean, but, given what we know, given everything we know about VAR, given not just like in the in FA competitions, but in the Confederations Cup last year, the Confederations Cup was a nightmare because of VAR. Like, well, I don't see how FIFA would do it any would do it much differently or much better this time around. They have said it's going to be on screens, though, haven't they, in the World mm -hmm. Cup? The, the fans in the stadium are like going to be involved, towards, which is yeah, look, working at towards least that. encouraging. Okay. What's um, just to finish off? What's our action plan then for for VAR? You've, you're the most, you've, you've experienced it most recently at Wembley on Wednesday. I, I, well, I, I don't know enough about how you work the technology to make this work, but you've got to have on the big screens what the video assistant yeah. referee is seeing. Okay. And, you can have the discussions. And also some you've got sort of... the discussions of that they're having. I mean, what's the problem to, with having... You've got to, the, the, you've got to make it part of the game. You've got to hear the event. discussion like they do in, in rugby union. It, you know, you've also got the, to have a moment... Stop the secrecy. ...where it's clear to the crowd that it's gone to VAR, because you're not yeah. even clear on that at the and moment. Something's what, got to... And also they've got to be clear what the question is. They have to... Because sometimes if you get a stoppage, people don't even know it was it for offside or for a foul in the build-up or whatever. So fans you, might like it if it's part of... We don't know. Fans... It, I think it would If catch, it becomes part of the experience in the game, they might right, if buy into if it. If you're replaying fouls over and over again on a big screen in a ground, everybody would maybe get into it and start cheering along, cheering on the replays. A bit like you get in cricket for when it goes to DRS. But the current, but you're right, the current system with the confusion and the ignorance is the problem. Mm. OK, lots of problems uh, for VAR. Lots of problems for some of the British managers in the Premier League. They all lost yesterday. Sam Allardyce, um, Alan Pardew. Uh, David Moyes, bad results for them. We'll talk about them coming next. Welcome back with us this morning, uh, Ollie Holt, uh, Jack Pitbrook and Matt Law. Let's just remind you what's on the back pages of the papers this morning. Uh, Mail on Sunday, uh, Arsene Wenger's replacement's already been lined up. It's the Germany national team manager, Joachim Love, according to Rob Draper this morning. Different story in the Express, though. The battle is on for Carlo Ancelotti. That's uh, Neil Fizzler this morning on the back page of the Express. What about the send-off? Uh, he deserves a royal send-off. That's Daniel Taylor's column in the Observer this morning. Um, Ollie's column, we've already talked, of course, at length about Wenger um, and the shame of how some treated him um, will cast a shadow over the Emirates when he finally does leave. Matt's just been talking uh, very vociferously about VAR getting the green light uh, for the World Cup, despite all the backlash. Doesn't want to see it in the Premier League next season. Uh, transfer story, uh, get in. Andres Iniesta on his way out of Barcelona, would you believe, um, could be joining Pep Guardiola at Manchester City. That's Steve Bates' story on the back page of The People this morning. Um, what about some of the teams at the foot of the Premier League? Not anymore. The Rocket Men, they're flying up the table. Uh, Carlos Carvajal at uh, Swansea. Massive win for them yesterday over West Ham. Um, we want to come on to some of those British managers because they were supposed to have the course, the distance and the experience. Sam Allardyce, um, David Moyes and Alan Pardew brought in to save their clubs, uh, respective clubs, from relegation. Um, they're all deep in trouble, with the exception of, of Everton, of course, but uh, West Ham certainly in, in uh, trouble. Um, and West Brom at the foot of the table. Who's been the biggest disappointment of those three managers for you, Matt? Alan Pardew. Um... He's just had no impact on results whatsoever, really. The other, the other two, I mean, Allardyce had an early bounce, which kind of, as you say, made it pretty much certain that Everton can't be dragged into it. West Ham had a, had a good spell and have been a bit sort of up and down. They go through good and bad. But I'm surprised at Pardew because I thought his character um, and his confidence in himself would give West Brom a little bounce at some stage and it just hasn't happened and with the whole taxi thing um, Daniel Sturridge coming in and getting injured at the moment everything's just going wrong for them I mean there's, there's generally a club in a season who look doomed not just by their results but by everything that's going on within the club and by the fact that everything goes wrong and, and, and West Brom are that now and uh, you just don't well Pardew's not going to get them out of it mm. Why hasn't he been able to change the mood around the place. Because you said he's, he's quite an upbeat character, incredibly confident. He's not to prove perhaps yeah, he's after leaving Crystal Palace. But why hasn't he been able to change um, the atmosphere around that club? It looks like the problems, like I say, run deeper than just bad performances 
or a lack of confidence. Um, the taxi episode gave an insight into the fact that attitudes probably aren't right at that club and haven't been right. And it, it's four senior players. Isn't yeah, it? and it looks far more deep-rooted and he's obviously not been able and not had the time to actually get into that and make, make a difference with that, where possibly the problems at Everton are more to do with an imbalanced squad, a lack of confidence, rather than attitude problems. Um, so I can only, I can only really, I don't know, but I can only really assume that, that that's been why Pardew's struggled with it. Does the struggles of the three managers strengthen the argument, Jack, that these British managers, the same names, always being recycled, always being brought in to save clubs, does it strengthen those arguments? I think so, yeah. I think that it might suggest that in, in the Premier League nowadays, the more foreign players we have, the more foreign managers we have, the old motivational techniques of the English manager might not be as powerful or as compelling to players as they used to be. Like the, mo I mean, the most successful new manager bounce we've seen this season is Carlos Carvalhal at Swansea, who's obviously, you know, he's got experience from Sheffield Wednesday, but no other experience in the Premier League. And yet he's come in and been able, through his tactics and coaching and his, his own charisma and force, force of personality, to make a bigger difference on that Swansea squad. And a few months ago, Swansea, not West Bromwich Albion, were the team who were looking like they, like they were finished. So I wonder whether the demands required for that, for that kind of firefighter manager have slightly changed. Yeah, I... I think that's a I think that's a fair point, but I also I also think that we're, we're so we're picking we're picking out three sure. British managers here, um, but each of them have been each of them have been shoved, shoved into tough jobs. And I take your point absolutely about Swansea. That's also a tough job, but then Paul Clement did a great job with them last season, getting them out. So um, I think part of it is that is that British managers quite often get the get the bad jobs they don't get they don't get the pick of the jobs maybe there's a reason for that but you look at I mean equally we could point to the job that Sean Dyche continues to do um, at Burnley so and I think if we look at I, I totally agree with what Matt said about Pardew I thought he'd have a bigger effect there and clearly the troubles run deep but I think also if you look at West Ham say with Moyes I mean West Ham has become something of a basket case of a club and I think they are still they are still fighting the um, discontent around the move to the stadium, which is going on and on, and the discontent with the ownership. There's a march, isn't there, coming up soon? Yeah. I mean, the club is not in a great place, and I think Moyes is fighting against that as well. So I, I, to I totally, I think Jack's point is a very interesting one, but I think there are other reasons why the British managers we're, put, we're, we're pointing out are struggling. You just brought up um, the protests and um, David Gold um, is involved in some, um, I think, some clashes with some supporters yesterday who confronted, confronted him after that 4-1 uh, defeat at Swansea yesterday. What, it, what, in your view, Ollie, is the correct way for supporters to voice their displeasure about either the ownership, the running of the football club, the way that the team is playing, the management, the executive or the board of directors? What's, what's the right way? Because clearly confronting David Gold in these circumstances doesn't feel it doesn't no, feel right it doesn't and and I think you know uh, David Gold is in his 80s isn't he I, yeah, I, I don't 82. yeah it, th that's not a, that's not a very good look um, having said that I think that supporters are given less and less of a voice um, now and I I'm gonna sound like I'm picking and choosing now which I am I suppose but I you know, I, I didn't like the, the booing and the vilification of Wenger um, at Arsenal. That's just my opinion. I, di I didn't think it was justified, but obviously the fans, have a, the fans had a different opinion. Some of the fans had a different opinion. That's their right. Generally, I must admit, I'm in favour of, of the fans being allowed to take direct action. I'm not talking about abusing David Gold in a car park, but I think protest marches... Good luck to them. If they, and to be fair to Arsenal fans, I say I don't agree with it. But good luck to them. They they pay their money. It's up to them how they how they be how they behave. And which is, which is more powerful in your view, Ollie? <clears throat> um, social protests on social media, or a protest and march to a stadium? Well, I which think have the bigger effect. I think protest to a march to a stadium because those are people those are people who. I, it's easy to protest on social media. We can all we can all fire off a, a line of abuse on social media. I think people who protest, uh, fans who protest, are 
showing that they how much they love the club, how much they care for a, for a cause, whether it's right or wrong, in my opinion or your opinion. Um, I admire them. I admire them for getting out there and stating their case. Mm. Which has the big effect? Do you think? Uh, the biggest effect is protests. Because they all monitor. Because yeah. The thing is, that the clubs all monitor. The clubs all monitor it, and whether they say they do or they don't, you know that the chairman, you know that the owners of football clubs are looking at social media and looking at the fan sure. reaction and the instant, spontaneous reflex sure. reaction of supporters. I mean, for me, I think the biggest reaction is protests inside the ground. Whether it's Charlton Athletic fans disrupting matches by throwing balls onto the pitch, or even, I mean, Blackpool fans not going for years has had a bigger kind of visual effect, I think, than than anything on social media. Mm -hmm. But then it's difficult because, you know, at the, Premier, at the top end of the Premier League, the interest is such that fans not going to games is only going to, you know, other fans will come and take their places, basically. You mm. can't have, you're, not, you're never going to have an empty Emirates or an empty London or an empty Olympic Stadium, are you, for Premier League? You did League on Thursday. Yeah. As a one-off, as a one -off, yeah. perhaps. Um, I think it's something, though, just one last thing on that, that probably, TV companies are scared of because empty seats in stadia mm. is not a good look and one of the things that the whole Premier League bubble is predicated around is the fan ex the fact that we are we've got a great fan culture in this country if you start getting empty seats mm. at Arsenal Man City exactly and that's why it's that's why it's so it's so wrong when clubs don't listen to the fans because ultimately the clubs are selling the cl the clubs are effectively selling the fans abroad right like the fans yeah. the fan the fans inside the ground make money for the clubs through the TV deals because people all over the world love watching grounds full of fans. And yet, when it comes to the opinions of the fans to do with the, the running and or not, not even like taking the club towards success, but the stewardship of the club, making sure it doesn't run aground, that's when the clubs kind of pull up the drawbridge and stop listening. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, every turn for Sam Allardyce at the moment, Matt, is a protest. Um, whether it's the supporters in the stands, whether it's on social media, it doesn't matter which every which way Sam Allardyce turns. Why is that? Another, another defeat from yesterday. It's a bad defeat. Um, but um, what is it about Sam Allardyce and Everton that just doesn't... It's quite, the same with Sam Allardyce right. and, and West Ham. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a vicious circle with Sam Allardyce because you bring him in to do a very specific job to obviously get back up the table, get away from, from relegation, do the, the kind of, try and do the basics right again. And then inevitably, the fans become annoyed by the style of play, the fact that they only have one... I mean, I was at the Watford game the other week where they only had one shot on target and it was well, terrible yeah, okay. to watch. So talk, talk us through the style of play in that, in, in that game because you, you watched that well, game. It was dreadful. Game. I mean, it was absolutely dreadful. He had a lot of attacking players on the pitch. I mean, Rooney was playing in midfield and there was just no attacking intent within what they were trying to do. They had one shot on target. They were, they were toothless. Uh, Jordan Pickford produced their best pass of the game. Jordan Pickford at the end probably had their best chance of the game when he went up for a corner. I mean, that just said it all. And again, I, this, this is a problem for a lot of clubs. It's a problem for West Ham, it's a problem for Arsenal, and now it's a problem for Everton, is that fans are getting sold dreams. Farhad Mashiri went in and talked about Champions League football, talked about style of play a lot, Hollywood managers, and then he's got himself into a position where they had to bring in Sam Allardyce to get them away from a relegation fight, which couldn't be far away, further away from Hollywood football and Hollywood names and Champions League football. That's why Everton fans are getting so annoyed, and that's why I have a lot of sympathy for Everton fans. If you're going to start telling fans to dream big, you can't be annoyed or upset when they dream big and then you let them down badly. And that's happening at a lot of clubs and a lot of owners and chief executives need to be careful about what they say and what they sell to fans on the back of these things. Although I, and I, I feel take that point, but, if, but uh, Everton in, specifically, I think Everton are missing the, the influence of Bill Kenwright, who I think is terrific. Bill Kenwright didn't sell any of those dreams and was, and was lambasted by the fans for it. So, you know, it would be accused of lack of ambition and not putting enough money into it. So. I, t I agree with you about the current ownership, but I think, you know, I think there are, I, I think they're showing that they're miss they, they are missing Ken right there. But Allardyce is suffering from it at the moment because the fans have bought into the fact that they, they think, and it might be right, that Mashiri is trying to do his best to deliver his promises. 
and yet they've got a guy in charge who can't deliver them. Now, I think that's a bit unfair on Allardyce. I actually think that Mashiri's made an awful lot of mistakes in his two years in charge, or however long it is, and that it's actually more his fault. But Allardyce has become the lightning rod for that now, and they don't want him there. I mean, the majority of Everton fans don't want him there. They don't do want think, him there past Do you think Everton season. made a mistake giving Allardyce the two-year contract? Yeah, but they probably had to do that to get him in at the time. The other difficulty is, is that they were going for someone like Marco Silva, who, by the way, has got a relegation on his CV and a sacking at Watford now, so I've never quite understood the mystique around Marco Silva. He did really well but, at Estoril. But they, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> they were going for Marco Silva based on the fact that they wanted a certain style of football and a certain way of presenting themselves as modern. And then, within a couple of weeks of missing out on Marco Silva, went straight to the other end of the scale. Which think, leaves people confused. But the, thing, the, thing with, the thing with Sam as well is that I, I think it's a really interesting point you make. You know what you're getting when mm. you when you appoint Sam. So to criticise him then for it seems a bit yeah. bizarre. And it's like even with the England job, I know it was off the field stuff, but he was basically fired for being Sam Allardyce. Mm. You know, um, he gets fired uh, everywhere for being Sam Allardyce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I do think they'll make a change in the summer. I personally. I think the Everton fans should just ride the season out because I think they'll get what they want in the in the end. But he doesn't. He never. The problem with Sam Sam is he's good for us. He, he's he's a very good talker. Um, I do feel, and this happened at West Ham. He doesn't do himself any favours. He can. Yesterday, the question was put to him about the fans chanting against him, and he kind of started to laugh as though, mm. say, oh, look, yeah, th these idiots. You know what they're talking. Mm. And he did a lot of that West Ham about the West Ham way, and. He doesn't mind riling the supporters, but it, it comes back to bite him. Mm. Your man, Marco Silva, will he get? Will he finally get the Everton job? Um, I think. <clears throat> I don't After think all that good work at Estoril. I think he was a bit reluctant. Oh, he has been a bit reluctant to replace Allardyce after after Everton went for Allardyce, having failed to get Silva. I still think I, th I think Silva will be fantastic for that job. I think what they need is they need to start from scratch. Basically, they need a new, young, ambitious manager who can who has a clear idea of what he wants to do and can build basically from the beginning with a bit of a blank slate. The problem with Allardyce is he's been, he's been thrown into a squad that's been badly constructed over the past few years. And what they really need is a kind of ambitious relaunch under someone like Silva. Whether, I, think, I wonder whether Silva would still be the right man given everything that's happened at Watford this season. But I, I mean, if, you, if they're looking for someone who's young, available, and ambitious, I think he's probably as good as, as they're going to get. He's got a relegation on his CV. And a well, you say, <laughs> also, you say it's badly constructed, and I, you may be right, but I, I thought they bought well. I mean, I was in common with many other people. I thought they bought well in the summer. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think their problem was that they sold Lukaku and didn't really replace him, which is a huge. Miss, but I thought, I mean, I've probably been proved wrong, actually, in this, but I thought, you know, I thought Michael Keane, Pickford, um, Sigurdsson... Well, Keane's been in disaster. Yeah, I know, I know, but I, I, all I mean is I thought that they... thought that they would be good signings. I mean, Keane, Keane came with a good reputation, didn't he, from... I thought Keane Burnley. would be a good signing. I yeah. thought it looked in balance. They got Klassen, Sigurdsson and Rooney. Yeah. And I never quite understood how... You should be signing one of those they, players, not all three. Yeah, I didn't yeah. quite understand how that was going to work. And surely, I agree on Keane and Pickford. I surely thought the first really thing you would signed. do, having sold Lukaku for that money, is buy a really good number nine. Yeah. They only bought Sanjay Ramirez. That was their big mistake, I think. Mm. But that's, I mean, that's Steve, Steve Walsh. You know, if we say that Sam's probably going the summer, Steve Walsh has got got a lot of answering to do, and he exactly. should probably go in the summer. But for teams um, at the bottom of the table, guys, who do you think are the most vulnerable? West Brom, of course, um, just can't win a game. It's three all, three all season. But two of the most vulnerable sides. I worry a bit about Newcastle. I don't think they've got many goals in the team. They've, they've had a few games recently, like the Bournemouth away one, and another before then, where they were ahead and going into the final minutes, and then. And then Drew, which means they lose two mm. points, and I don't know. I, I, they went over United, though. That will give them a bit of confidence. That was that they great. Yeah, it. that was great. But I, I don't know. I worry a bit about them. I okay. think the other teams around them have got more firepower. Mm. Crystal no, Palace, a bit concerned Palace. about at the moment. A lot of injuries. Yeah. A lot of injuries. They, they had that bounce, and now they're struggling. I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Zaha when he comes back. Yeah. Okay. They play Manchester United tomorrow night. Sell us part, Ollie. Well, I worry a bit about Stoke. Mm. I, I mean, again... City for them next, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I, I just... I look at their side and I'm not sure that they've got the, the quality... Um, 
and they they seem you know they've not had much of a bounce uh, under Lambert. I, I don't know. I just I wonder if their if their time is up yeah. um, in the Premier League. Sure. Okay. Under a bit of pressure, all those clubs at the foot of the table. Okay. Um, don't adjust your television sets. We're going to talk about the Championship. It's coming next. OK, um, we're going to talk about the Championship. It's the division just below the Premier League. Oh, yeah, I know, you know you all about it. You don't need to tell me. I'm uh, a Stockport fan. I'll go lower than the Championship. <laughs> um, we well, saw a Championship game a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? I did. Yeah. yeah, I went to Fulham Villa. You did. Was, uh, any chance to go to Craven Cottage. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Fulham in a minute. But um, Cardiff for the side, uh, Fulham are banging for them. So Cardiff, and you, the man you know very well, um, of course, is manager of Cardiff City, and that's Neil Warnock. Uh, what is it about him and... Um, the championship and getting promotions that he seems he's an absolute expert in it. Yeah. But what is it that seems to suit him so much about life at that level? Well, I think one of one of his remaining ambitions, he hasn't got that many things left to do, but is to is to become the all time leading mm. um, promotion winner. And I think if he does this, it'll be seven or eight, and I'll put him clear of Dave Bassett <coughs> and um, Graham I mean, Taylor, I think. I think. Dave so, Bassett's all automatic. I can't. I think Neil, a couple of Neils might have been in the playoffs, but I, I can't. No, you don't need to mention things like that. Those are details. Um, so, I, I don't know. I've, I've seen a lot of stuff from Cardiff fans saying, and, and local journalists there saying, that they feel that he understands the club. You know, he, he really gets the club. And I think, I think Neil would say himself that the, the, the championship really is his, is his level. I don't, he hasn't enjoyed his time in the Premier League, I, I don't know whether that's the players that he's had to deal with. Um, I think he, you know, he hasn't been particularly successful in the Premier League for whatever reason. But he, um, he has got a fantastic record in the lower leagues, and particularly the Championship of getting clubs up. Um, he's not a shrinking violet, as um, as Manchester, some of Manchester City's players found out. Um, and I think he, you know, he has. I am a, uh, a friend of his, but he has, I think he has done a brilliant job at Cardiff on not a lot of money mm. compared to the money that some of the other clubs have spent. Um, and as you said, they're in, at the moment, they're in, um, with Wolves, they're in pole position. Yeah, they are in pole position. Um, let's talk about Fulham as well, because they're on, they're on the charge. Um, you spent a bit of time with the manager this week as well, Jack, didn't you? What, what, is, what has he got? Because he's different... It is a, it's a, diff it's a clash of cultures here, isn't it, between what Fulham, the way that Fulham approach the game and the way that, the way that Neil Warnock relies on, the approach that Neil relies on um, in the Championship. But what has he got about him? Well, I think Fulham are probably the best footballing team in the Championship. Like, they completely outplayed Wolves the other week. They're now unbeaten in nine, a run in which they've beaten Villa, Wolves and Derby County yesterday. Uh, I think Jukanovic has got a lot of Championship experience as well. Like, he, he got Watford promoted a few years ago. A really good team who played great football and scored a lot of goals. I think what's really made the difference this recently for Fulham is that they've played good football for a while under Jukanovic, but in January they got three new guys with, with relevant experience. Christie, Matt Target and Mitrovic from Newcastle. Mitrov like they're, they're a very nice full team, Fulham. They play lovely stuff, but I think they lacked a bit of a nasty edge up front, whereas Mitrovic has given them exactly that. He's got three goals in his last three. He's a little bit of a... I mean, I think he lost a bit of motivation, he's unfit at Newcastle, lost focus. But he, he obviously wants to get fit for the World Cup. He's made a big difference since he's been there. And I know they've got a big gap to make up to Cardiff, but I, you wouldn't want to get them in the playoffs if they're there. Mm. What, um, how good is Sessegnon? Seriously good, seriously good. I mean, he's, you know, he's only 17. Yep. He's so quick. I think he's played all but about 25 minutes in the league for them this year, which is a remarkable show of trust from Mikanovic. It's not like he's put him in for a few games and taken him out to give him a, to give him a breather. Um, he, yeah, he's an incredible player, and it's no surprise, really, that lots of the biggest clubs in England are interested in him for next season. Mm. Well, there was a stat around, wasn't there, that certainly last week, that in the top four divisions, only Aguero scored more this year than, than Sessegnon which is unbelievable for a 17-year-old. He didn't have a terrific game when I went, but he still scored, so that, that yeah. tells you something. Yeah, he's yeah. got 14 so far um, this season. There's another stat as well, wasn't there? Um, or a quote right. from him on, uh, on fr I think, Friday or Saturday morning, Matt, and when he said that his hero as a kid growing up was, um, Luke, was Luke Shaw. Shaw. Yeah, it just shows it's, made it's us frightening, very old. isn't it? Frightening. Yeah, it is frightening. Um, another team that's in decent nick as well, though, Aston Villa. They're in the mix, third in the table mm. under Steve Bruce. Um, are they equipped to do it? Can they seal an autumn, 
can they seal? Can they get one of those automatic places? We're I mean, assuming the second now is, is more realistic. They're equi I mean, all season they've been equipped for it. I mean, you look at their squad and after Wolves, you would say they've got the strongest squad. They're still very reliant on a few individuals. John Terry, Jack Grealish, uh, Adoma. And if they, I mean, they've had a little spell without Grealish and Adoma and the, the results did dip a little bit and they, they've come again. And if any of them got injured for the run and I think they'd have a problem. Um, but a bit like Warnock, I mean, Bruce is the master of the championship as well. A great record of promotions. I mean, Villa fans were, were sort of killing him early season when Villa started badly and th there was definitely a, a decent section who were calling for him to go. He's turned it round and got them on a run. But then my only fear for both Villa and Cardiff is that if one of those, if just one of those two teams gets up, whether it be automatically or through the playoffs, I do think that, that Warnock or, or Bruce will find themselves kind of up against it and in trouble and, and possibly sacked next season because they're the masters of getting up with a style that isn't necessarily e always easy on the eye. And if they get up and, and start badly in the Premier League, they'll quickly have the fans saying they're not Premier League managers again. Whereas I think if Jokanovic mm. gets up, he'll get a bit more understanding, a bit more freedom because of the style of play and the slightly different way he's doing things there. But it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant race again behind Wolves. I mean, we always say this about the Championship, but a few weeks ago, Derby looked nailed on. They've had a wobble. Villa were in a magnificent run, then they've had a little wobble. Fulham are the team in the run, whereas Cardiff are the ones just grinding it, grinding it out. And you fear, you feel rather than fear that there's going to be more twists and turns, that there'll be a bit more leapfrogging and jostling. But that second place is, is going to go pretty much the wire. Yeah, thank from, you a, from a sentimental point of view, apart from it being Villa being such a great sort of club, I think there is also, I, I feel, a sentiment towards Steve Bruce as well. I mean, he's at that, at that um, the Fulham game, you know, he, he's, he's had a terrible time in his, in his personal mm -hmm. Life recently with his father dying and his his um, his mother ill and um, you know he dealt with all that with incredible grace and uh, you know I think the the way that he's dealt with it the way that his staff have dealt with it when he's been out of the game you just um, you know I'd, I'd I'd love to see them go up one way or another. Sure. Um, in terms of sense, the word that Ollie just used. Um, Two clubs, two big clubs at the foot of uh, the championship. Birmingham, who sacked Steve Cottrell last night after their defeat against Nottingham Forest, but also Sunderland at the foot and rooted to the foot of the championship. How do you feel about the about big clubs when they go through those periods of gloom, despair, fans are dis disillusioned? Um, does it does it make you feel any different about the game that those clubs of those size with that kind of with that kind of support are struggling so badly? It's difficult. Obviously, I mean, that was one is now heartless. For teams to win and succeed, other teams have to lose and fail. Like, you can't have promotion without relegation. It, you're right, it does... It is particularly sad to see a team like Sunderland, which is as well-supported as they are, as important to the local community as they are, in such a mess, particularly given that they, like, their fan base should make them, should give them enough resources to sustain themselves, maybe, you know, maybe not even in the Premier League, but certainly at the top end of the Championship. It's clearly they've made lots of bad decisions. They got sucked into a cycle of short-termism with managerial appointments, whereby they effectively appointed a new guy at the halfway through every season just to keep them in the Premier League, who would then get sacked halfway through the next season. And now all of a sudden, you know, they've, they've kind of completely lost their footing. And they're not putting any more money in, and they're heading down into League One. And Birmingham as well, Matt, who well, they're not a big the club. Up. They're not a big club. Birmingham, Birmingham's a big city, but Birmingham are not a big club. Fan base. For an average game, 15, 20,000. How many were there at Wembley for the um, the Yeah, they turn out for Wembley and Villa, and that's it. They're not a big club. All through my life, they've bounced between League One and the Championship. It's about their level. Big uh, city, but not a big club. I don't like it when. What I don't like is when big. Is that your final word? Is yeah. when big big <laughs> sides are big sides big clubs are ruined by bad owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I think that that's happening at. Sunderland, I think it has happened in the past at Leeds, in particular. I, you know, I know Leeds isn't perfect. I'd I'd love to see Leeds back in the Premier League. Sheffield Wednesday, Wednesday. Sheffield, League Sheffield Wednesday, are a great club. Now. Sheffield Wednesday, are a great club. I wonder whether I fear Sunderland, big club. Sunderland big club. won't be back in the Premier League in a hurry. I hope it's quicker than Leeds' time out of the Premier League. Sure. 
OK, um, we're going to go back um, to Premier League matters. Next, we're going to talk Man City, Chelsea, Andres Iniesta. Is he really leaving Barcelona to join him at the Etihad? More on that next. OK, bit of transfer business to clear up. Steve Bates uh, in the Sunday People loves the transfer story. Get in. Uh, Alger Zeniesta is linked in with a move from Barcelona in the summer uh, to Manchester City. Um, why are you giggling away? Just, just the fact that you say he loves the transfer story. What's wrong with that? He does. Yeah, great. It was a nice thing to say. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't tearing apart his... I wasn't, doing, I wasn't ruining his reputation. No, do that. I don't He's a guest. We I love know. having him on this programme. Steve, I hope Andre Iniesta signs for Man City, OK? Uh, will he sign? Should he sign? Should they go and get him? Uh, will he sign? I honestly don't know. It's certainly not... Should he sign? OK. Should he sign? Would you It'd love be... to see Iniesta play in the Premier League for Man City? Yes, City? yes. I would love to see Iniesta play in the Premier League, definitely. Um, I don't quite know where he fits into the Manchester City team squad, as ridiculous as that sounds, that you're saying that you might not be able to... F <laughs> fit Iniesta in. It tells you where yeah. Manchester City are. He's only won the eight La Liga titles. Yeah, I'm sure Guardiola would fit him in. I, I, I think there's other areas that they might be able to strengthen better. Um, but I would, it'd be brilliant to see him in the Premier League, yeah. Mm. It's amazing. I mean, City already have a problem with too many good creative attacking midfielders. I think that Guardiola can't help himself but try and squeeze them all in at the same time. Like The, the worst City have played recently was the first half of the Carabao Cup final when he had Gundogan, Fernandinho, De Bruyne and David Silva trying to find space in the same midfield. Uh, and it was only when he kind of rearranged the system that City played better. But clearly, I think sometimes Pep can't really help himself. And if he, I mean, it's, if he can just add one, one more brilliant little creative attacking midfielder into the team, then I think City might crack it next year. This one would be irresistible, wouldn't it? Um, Man City do play uh, Chelsea this afternoon at the Etihad, but I'd like to talk about some of the potential the contenders for, for player of the year. I know it's a little bit early because the business end of the season is only just beginning, Ollie. but with that in mind, with the Man City-Chelsea in mind, I'm thinking, of course, uh, De Bruyne and the season that he's had. But Mo Salah last night, uh, irrepressible for, for Liverpool um, at, um, at Anfield, 32 goals um, for him. Harry Kane, of course, um, yeah. playing for Tottenham, who you saw put that ball in yesterday uh, for Son's goal um, across the back four. But um, uh, you may pick and choose a player outside of that, that three, but are they, are they the three that we expect to be um, fighting out for the trophy? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's interesting... And I'm guilty of it too. I think it's interesting that we don't mention Aguero. Mm. Um, he never seems to get a look in, in in those circumstances. I think it's absolutely fair to mention Harry Kane, not just because of the goals he scored, but as you say, the three of us were all at the uh, Wembley um, yesterday, and even though Harry Kane didn't score, he probably produced the most memorable moment of the game with his, with his pass uh, for Son's second goal. So... Um, my own vote at this stage would go to um, De Bruyne, I think, just... I mean, you said earlier that he, he has a bit of a dip, but, I mean, a dip in... Um, uh, well, I, dip, yeah, a dip, I said that, I said that off air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we love, no, we no, like no, but, I mean, it's not exactly the most brutal criticism, Neil, but um, I think <laughs> And he, and he that, played a pass for one of the goals as well at, um, at the Emirates on, yeah. uh, on Thursday night, but apart from that... Is, but, I mean, uh, a dip by Man City standards this season possibly, is, yeah. is a pretty low dip, but um, I... Yeah, I would, I would go for De Bruyne. I think he's just been fantastic this season. He's, um, he's got everything, and he's showed everything this season. OK, he's not scored as many goals as some of the contenders we've mentioned, but I think that he, he has... Um, he's been the creative, the creative force, an incredibly creative Manchester City team. So. I think he's been the, this has been the best season by a midfielder I can remember in the Premier League. For years, like I can't, like Ollie said that De Bruyne's the complete midfielder. I can't think of anyone else who combines that level of athleticism, passing, football brain, technical skill, goals from distance. Like he's got, he's got the absolute lot. Even I mean, people yeah. always used to say that about Paul Pogba, but De Bruyne's been in another world from Pogba this season. Yeah, I mean, the, the, some of his strikes that have been so yeah. clean and powerful. I mean, and he's got that kind of power through the middle of the pitch, which yeah. reminds you a little bit of Steven Gerrard. But I think even on top of what Gerrard's got, he's kind of got two-footedness, he's got maybe a bit of an ability to play in different positions or understanding the game. Like he's, just, he's, he's on another level from any other midfielder I've seen in the Premier League mm. for the last sort of 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Matt, can you make a case for Mo Salah? Please. You, you can, 
You can make a case for him, certainly, and he, he definitely deserves to be, you know, in the nominations and, and kind of high up there. But uh, I've always gone by the theory that uh, the team that's really going to kind of win the trophies, the best player of that team is generally the, the player of the year. You can make exceptions and, it, you know, Liverpool could still win the Champions League. Um, and if he takes them to win the Champions League, that'd be a very strong argument. But at this time, it's, it's, I find it very difficult to argue against De Bruyne, and I, I wouldn't want to. I mean, Mo Salah's been superb. Um, and also, a big surprise in a way, because while I think everyone thought Liverpool were buying a good player, I don't think we thought they were buying this player. Um, he's far exceeded lots of expectations. Yeah, OK. So it uh, looks like the vote's really for De Bruyne. So far. Um, let's move on to um, the game itself, Manchester City against Chelsea this afternoon. Um, Conte's been talking again on Friday about the, well, it was a lack of ambition, but clearly Conte's ambitions are another Premier League title to succeed in the Champions League. And there was another hint on Friday, Jack, that uh, he doesn't feel that he's got the total back in total to support the board. Um, is, is that right? Yeah, I mean, he, he was, I think on Friday was the most critical I've ever heard him. It was in his press conference at Cobham, and he was saying that he's a, basically, I'm a great manager, I have great ambition. Uh, does the club have as much ambition as me? Well, you'd have to ask them. I mean, it's very, very obvious what he was getting at, which is that he is envious that he hasn't been able to spend as much money as Guardiola. He thinks that that, that difference in what they've been able to spend explains the difference between Chelsea and City, and that had he had the same resources as Pep, then Chelsea would be doing as well as City are. I mean, why, doesn't he, why doesn't he say that? Because Chelsea's point of view here, presumably, is that the, the, the wild spending days, the, that era, 2004, 2005, 06, 07, is over, and now they're managing the club a different way. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, how, how Chelsea have gone from being the, you know, the biggest spenders in town to now almost looking, I mean, not, not quite like Arsenal, but closer to Arsenal than to City, like a team who ultimately can't compete with City for the, for the biggest players, the biggest salaries. Mm. I mean, it, this is more a frustration of Conte's career. I mean, he, he said this all throughout his Juventus career as well. He believes, and he believes he's proved, that he's one of the best coaches on the planet. <laughs> and he never feels he's had the financial backing or the opportunity within a job to really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Guardiola and Mourinho and prove that he's better than them. And he thought that by winning the Premier League last season, it would give him the keys to that treasure trust, if you like, and really give him the opportunity to do that. And it hasn't. And it's as much a frustration, it's a big frustration for him at Chelsea, but it's a big frustration, I think, of him, of his career. And I, I get it in a way, because I do think he is an incredible coach, and he wants a job and an opportunity in which to, to really go to say, and he doesn't feel he can without the budget. On the other hand, um, there's an argument on the spending with Chelsea and Man City because while Chelsea don't spend as much as Man City, some of Man City signings Chelsea could have afforded. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the goalkeeper Edison, Gabriel Jesus, Leroy yeah. Sane, that was a matter of scouting. Sorry, mate, we've been beaten by time, Go. I'm afraid. You'll get another chance the next time you're on, though. Um, thanks very much to the guys for joining us this morning. Thanks to Ollie, uh, thanks to Jack, thanks to Matt for joining us on the Sunday Supplement.